So, Chris is bragging that he banged Lois, Meg is kissing her dad, and Cleveland's family are finally back. Or are they? All of that and more happens in Family Guy's most recent episodes, all of which I'm going to break down and review in this very video. So, let's start with episode 10, Cabin Pressure. So if you saw my last review of the episode before this one, The Return of the King of Queens, then you'd know I absolutely hated it. I even called it one of the worst Christmas episodes that Family Guy has ever done, so I was genuinely hoping that this one would be a vast improvement. And luckily, it is. Although, not by much. The episode opens with Peter taking the family to a work company picnic, and it's here we do get a pretty funny Bob's Burgers joke. There's the guy who started after me and was beneath me, but now he's like higher up than I am. Hey, Bob. Hey, Darren. By the way, do comment if you'd like to see more Bob's Burgers content over on this channel. I love that show. Moving on though, and Peter's boss Preston arranges a game of egg tossing, with the prize being a status holiday home in Maine. Peter then wins, inviting all of his friends and their families along for a jolly. And you best believe I was very shocked to see Cleveland Jr., Rallo, and Roberta there all at the same time. And if you've been watching my channel for a while now, you'd know I've spoken at length about how I wish Family Guy would include these characters more. Like Cleveland Jr. has spoken a bit, but not much. Rallo literally hasn't said a word since he moved to Spooner Street back in season 12. Sup, man? Yeah, yeah, sup. Keep walking, you boondocks ripoff. And Roberta, she hasn't spoken at all. Therefore, when I saw them, I was kind of hopeful that they may be able to interact with, say, the Griffin kids, but no, they don't. They literally don't say anything, and I was really, really disappointed. It could have made a genuinely interesting B-plot to have the kids doing their thing while the adults do their own thing, but it was just such a wasted opportunity. I guess at least they were there though, unlike Joe and Bonnie's daughter Susie, who is a character I literally can't remember last seeing. What happened to her? Nonetheless, circling back, and the only thing Peter wants to do on the trip was to see a bear show, but Quagmire has such a tight itinerary that he ends up missing it. And to make things worse, it was the final ever bear show before it was to be closed down. Being pissed off, Peter yells at his friends and family before accidentally burning the cabin down. Everyone then returns to help to repair it, but they only then make things worse. And then Preston arrives and rather than being angry about it, he's happy about it. You don't understand. I hate it up here. Yeah, and... Just when you think we're about to get a happy ending, it turns out that it was all just a dream caused by a stress heart attack. Poor Darren. Like many others, I'm sure, I'm not a big fan of the whole it was a dream type ending. They're lazy. But at least the callback to Bob Belcher was a funny way to close out the episode. As a whole, I think Cabin Pressure did have an interesting premise. You could have had a lot of fun with it. It could have been similar to the movie Grown Ups, with a bunch of middle-aged friends going to a cabin with their families with some hilarious antics to follow, but the idea was pretty much wasted as the writers didn't take any opportunity to make it interesting, have any interactions, or just have any fun with it. This was a rare opportunity to have all of these families and friends under one roof, and you could have really played with them getting annoyed with each other, but there's nothing like that, apart from the fact that Lois clogged the toilet. That's why I need your help. That is not a poop a woman can come back from. There weren't too many funny standout moments either to balance out this problem, aside from the aforementioned Bob's Burgers jokes and the one scene where Peter is watching a YouTube video on how to fix a cabin, only to be distracted by a video of a gerbil singing opera. <laughs> oh, touche recommended videos. But that was kind of it for the laughs. Saying this though, it was a big improvement over the last episode, therefore making it a decent but still middle of the road kind of episode. So for this one, I'm gonna give it three out of five stars. Now let's move on to episode 12, Teacher's Heavy Pet. In it, Lois gets a substitute teaching job at Chris's school under the name Miss Pewterschmidt. Meanwhile, Chris wins the title of the homecoming dunce for the fourth year running, making him the least popular kid in school. Every year I'm the homecoming dunce and every year the bullying gets worse. 
So he thinks by lying and saying that he slept with the hot new teacher, it would get him in with the cool kids. And it kind of worked because no one knew that Miss Pewterschmidt was in fact Chris's mother. She and I slept together under the same roof. Eventually though, everyone started to suspect that Chris was making it all up, so they demanded proof. And Chris, being the weird, strange little boy that he is, sneaks into the bathroom while Lois takes a shower and takes a sneaky picture. This strange behavior isn't new, seeing as the show has this running joke of Chris having a serious Oedipus complex, i.e. making him attracted to his mother. And I'll pleasure myself to your photos. Me too. Like in season two, when Lois is homeschooling Chris and Meg, he passes her a note saying that he thought Mrs. Griffin was hot. I think Mrs. Griffin's hot. Go to your room. And then he even dated a girl called Lindsay who looked exactly like Lois. So yeah, this strange and incredibly unhealthy obsession with his own mother is definitely nothing new. But to be fair, in this case, he doesn't actually fancy his mom. He was just more going along with it for the popularity points. But even still, it is weird that this is a running theme with Chris as well as the show as a whole, because the writers will continue to make more incest jokes a few episodes later. But back to this episode of a series of unfortunate events and Lois finds the nude photo of her and makes Chris admit the truth in front of the entire class. But when she realizes that he will go back to being the school loser, she then jumps in front of him to say that they did in fact bang. Chris Griffin was the biggest thing I ever had. <laughs> thus saving his popularity in the process, which is kind of cute, I guess. No, no, yes, it's still very weird. And as a result of this, she then spends six years in jail. Mom got six years for sex with a minor. Once again, an okay episode. Not bad, not great, just kind of fine. Although I do think this one edges slightly more over the last one. Like the scene where Quagmire is blended to the wall so he could spy on Lois did make me laugh. And I kind of like the fact that we find out that Chris hangs out with Bonnie so they can watch movies together. I'm going to Bonnie's room. You mean your room? No, Bonnie's room. Not to mention, we also find out that Meg can see dead people. And because of this gift, she basically acts as a janitor for the ghosts. The uh, ghost toilet is clogged again. Requires a human fist. <sighs> All in all though, that's kind of it for the positive. So I'm giving this one three out of five stars. Moving on next, and we have episode 12, Take This Job and Love It. This anthology episode has the gang opening up on what jobs they'd really love to do. Now there's an interesting question. What would be your dream job? With Peter wishing he could be a spy, Quagmire telling a story about being an aerobics instructor in the 80s, and the final segment being a lethal weapons parody with Joe and Cleveland. Family Guy tends to do an anthology episode at least a couple of times a season, and they also tend to be very hit or miss, and that's very much the case here. The first segment was definitely the best, the second one was fine, and the final one was pretty bad. But despite me thinking that the 007 parody was the best one, it still wasn't great. Because one of my biggest gripes with Family Guy is that they feel they have to over explain a certain joke like we're complete idiots. Like take the scene right here where Peter is skiing and he's then replaced by a stunt double and a fake background. Yep, all definitely me. Whoosh. It was funny, right up until he explained it. Unfortunately, the show does this a lot and it always kills the joke. Don't get me wrong though, it was fun seeing Megas take a penny, leave a penny, Donna as M. Mm hmm. M is fine. Okay, yeah, and I, I, times have changed and I, I, gotta, I need to catch up. And Stewie being Blowfella. You're just gonna have us killed by your henchmen? Oh, okay, I'd rather you not use that word. They are independent contractors. Moving on to the second segment, and it's all about how Jane Fonda stole Quagmire's idea for an aerobics video, and I didn't laugh once. Therefore, leaving the final segment of Cleveland and Joe being cops, which sounds like a fun idea on paper, but the execution was dull as hell. Admittedly, this might be because most of the jokes rely on you having to watch Lethal Weapon, which I haven't, but that shouldn't matter because a great parody can stand on its own if you don't know the source material. Like, I never got any of the Treehouse of Horror movie references as a kid, but I still thought they were brilliant. Hey. 
Hi, David. I'm Grandpa. Unfortunately, it's always been an issue with Family Guy and specifically their movie anthology episodes. So for Take This Job and Love It, I'm going to give it two out of five stars. So now we've come to episode 13, Lifeguard Meg. With this time, instead of Maine, the family take a trip to the aquarium and Meg is so desperate for some kind of connection that she touches a stingray. You have no idea you're here. giving me a gift right now. Take care now. Meanwhile, Stewie asks a member of staff if he can be peed on because he's been stung by a jellyfish. Now, is there an attractive, well-hydrated manager I can speak to? Which was very funny. Oh yeah, MPSA, emphasis on the pee, do not pee on a jellyfish sting because it actually makes it worse. So, so don't do that if it actually happens to you, okay? This joke is continued when Stewie wonders if dolphins can also sting, and as he ponders this, he falls into the tank. And before Peter can jump in to save him, he takes out his spare phone he keeps hidden from Lois. Hold my second phone I hide from your mother. Hang on. Respond with an eggplant emoji. And later on in this same episode, they make another infidelity joke, this time about Lois. I have to take this. Hey, you. Now, this is what the 50th joke they've made about cheating on each other by now? Come on, guys. Anyway, Meg jumps in and saves Stewie. And this brave act gets her a job as a lifeguard in the local water park, a job that she absolutely loves because it keeps her away from her family. But then her dad and his buddies show up and they spend all their time there, which annoys her to no end. I saw a sign about active diarrhea. What if it's very passive? And at first, I thought Meg's job as a lifeguard would then lead back into the joke earlier about Meg needing touch and companionship, but no, no follow through there. Like she could have felt that feeling of connection by saving or teaching kids swimming, or saving a hot guy, I don't know, but instead her job leads her into something which is a lot more bizarre. But I'm getting ahead of myself here, like I haven't even spoken about this random Benny Hill reference, which is a joke that Family Guy has probably done about five times already. And I don't know about you guys, but it's never made me laugh. And it's not just Family Guy, I remember The Simpsons doing it a few times too, and it's mostly always used when something about Britain is involved, but as a British person, I have never once seen The Benny Hill Show, and I actually don't think it's been on UK TV since 1989. But I don't know, maybe America just really loves Benny Hill. Enough of my ranting though, because as Peter falls and Meg has to resuscitate him by giving him mouth to mouth, she brings him back to life and everyone just laughs at them because they touched mouths and it's an incest joke. Again. This was a strange detour from the whole lifeguard subplot because I don't really understand what's funny and strange about giving mouth to mouth to someone when they are literally about to die. What's creepy about CPR? Yeah, I was just saving his life. I wanna believe that, Meg, but look what people are saying on Facebook. It was just such an unnecessary way to add some kind of conflict into the third act. Plus, they've already done an incest joke just a couple of episodes ago. But pushing through with this and the mouth-to-mouth -mouth thing only makes things weird between Meg and Peter. So when he has another accident, Meg refuses to give him CPR. So this time, Stewie randomly comes in and does it himself. You stick your tongue down dad's throat, most natural thing in the world. This then leads on to Peter apologising to Meg and saying that he loves her, but Meg shuts that down. We've had conversations like this again and again and nothing ever changes. But when he says it in sign language, she loves him again. Like, what is going on? But guess what? None of this happened and it doesn't matter because it was all a dream because a voiceover explains that he wasn't really resuscitated until much later on. I did wake up eventually, but now I need help feeding and bathing myself. So, yep, yeah, they pulled the it was all a dream thing again. Now, I did think Meg being a lifeguard was an interesting idea, but they quickly abandoned that in favour of everyone being creeped out that she did CPR. I kind of hated that. But at least the writers are continuing to use Meg as an actual character instead of a single punchline. And if my calculations are correct, I believe this is the third Meg-centric episode of this season. And you know me, I'm always up for more Meg, so please keep fleshing out her character. Saying that though, this one wasn't great. Moving on to the B-plot and Stewie and Brian take over a coffee shop, but neither of them know how to make coffee, so they serve instant fog as coffee instead. 
And just when you think they're about to get away with it, Principal Shepard walks in and they fear that he'll be able to tell the difference and catch them out. So it all leads up into Shepard drinking the coffee. And yet, he knows it's Folgers, and that's pretty much it for this episode. And it ends very abruptly, it's kind of boring, and most of the jokes revolve around coffee shop puns. Java the Hut, Perks and Recreation. Uh, uh, lost and Ground. It is a shame that pretty much every single Stewie and Brian story this season has sucked. Bad. Like, do we remember when their adventures used to be the best part of the show? Just like the other episodes I've spoken about, this one again was fine. Not awful, not great, so for this one, I'm gonna give it 2.5 out of 5. And overall, this season so far has been super lackluster, and it feels like a way to chug these seasons along by throwing out these average episodes. Which does genuinely hurt me to say because I love Family Guy and I know I'm being very harsh, but again, these are my personal opinions and my personal ratings, but do let me know yours down in the comments below. 